Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the Missionaries of Charity. He's the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. When you said mystery, of course, and then began to speak of the, the the Eucharist. It is that mystery that isn't it the Latin for it's a sacrament. That's that fullest of all communication, the communion with that mystery. That's the the real gift of what we find within the whole experience of the church. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what takes place in in sacraments, and also in if we go to confession even with small venial sins. and But a divine act takes place in the words of the absolution, a divine act, meaning an immediate, direct divine act of God takes place at the consecration at a mass. And something like that, we can assume, may take place in prayer if we grow across thresholds in our prayer, that God is directly, immediately, communicating himself to our soul in love, but we're not capable. The human faculties are not capable of a kind of grasp of that reality of God. It's too far beyond us. It's an interesting thing, too, in one way, that in our own time, when we realize the number of years that the universe has been in existence, of the stretch of the cosmos, and God is beyond all of that. And it may be that we have to sometimes, once in a while, think of that. We are so small ourselves, you know, just a man, a woman, a child before God, and his infinite stretch of reality, and not that physical reality, he's beyond all that, and his infinitude of love. So we don't grasp this in our in our faculties, but we can be aware in a certain way of a longing for him in love. And he is communicating a drawing power toward himself in love as we go further in prayer. It reminds me of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, a Sacra Sanctum Concilium, that it talks about how the liturgy, in particular the Eucharist, is the source from where all graces flow that it is not just some of them, but all of them. And yet, as you've just described, it's that constant calling of God, of of the Father, to be able to share in in that communion. And as as you said, not just in the Eucharist, but in all the, the various expressions of the sacraments that we have that are to help us in our prayer in all things. Am I correct in that? Certainly correct. And, you know, it is a good thing in our spiritual life, and maybe we have alluded to it in some of the previous conversations, that we, in a sense, pay greater respect to the magnitude of God. And it isn't easy, you know, human tendency to try to pull God down to our experience, because we love him, and we want to have immediate, satisfying experience of him. But what we might be doing in that effort at times is to pull him down and, in effect, to reduce him from the infinite magnitude of his infinite love. And the reality of God is so beyond us. And at the same time, how personal he is. Thank God that we have the Eucharist, that that was in God's divine plan. 
that we can have him immediately present to us in his incarnate, resurrected body, blood, soul, divinity, his personal presence when we pray in front of the Eucharist. But we should also be aware that's not going to simply open us to, you know, an emotional comfort with him. We are there, or if we walk up a line step by step to receive him in the Eucharist, we're walking step by step before the God of the universe, concealed under that appearance of what looks like a host. The God of the universe is there in front of us. So that kind of calming, humbling awareness is important in the life of prayer, that we come before God. You know, missionaries of charity, it's just a gesture that they do, but when they go into the chapel for the first time in the morning, they put their head to the floor before God, before the incarnate God who is there in the tabernacle. You know, they put their head to the floor, you know, when the consecration takes place. I think monastic life, they do this sometimes too. And they bow, you know, to the floor before the monstrance at benediction. These gestures, you know, remind us also that we are there before a God of infinite reality. You know, some of the experience with John of the Cross, we'll talk about it, that some of the satisfying experiences that we do sometimes seek in prayer are satisfactions of our natural faculties. They may not be so supernatural as we think that the natural experience of a faculty is to enjoy knowledge or understanding or the comfort you know, of a, a satisfying experience in will or of emotion. But with God, supernatural experiences are often not going to be touching us in satisfaction. You know, there's something deeper. There are deeper layers of the soul being touched by God in prayer or in the reception of the Eucharist or when we're present at a Mass. You know, as you're saying that, it strikes me the dance, as it were, that sometimes we do when we try to separate the experience of prayer or the experiences of our soul with what might be considered the psychological nature of the human person. That in a very real way for St. John of the Cross, he is the integration, the understanding of the wholeness of what the human person is experiencing. You can't separate them out. You can't say this is the psychological nature and this is the spiritual nature. They're integrated, aren't they? Yeah, they're integrated. And it's a good point you bring up, Chris, because sometimes we are, because we're human and we, you know, we have our mind and our awareness, our consciousness, we look to those experiences of what we immediately experience in our consciousness, what we're aware of. And yet there may be deeper realities to the human person, not just the soul, but this is a, um, an understanding from the early church, you know, that we not only soul and body, but spirit, soul and body. And some of what St. John of the Cross is teaching is that God, the spirit of God with a capital S is touching that inner spirit of the human person, which may not be so accessible at all to our consciousness, that God is drawing us from deep undercurrents within us, these deeper undercurrents of disposition, of longing for him, that's not immediately available to our, our conscious awareness. And there's greater depth of mystery in this. John of the Cross will talk about that God is at the center of the soul and that the deeper we grow in love, in a sense, the deeper we are plunging into the reality of God at this deeper center of the soul. But we don't have immediate experience of that. It's part of the life of prayer to continue to surrender, but it's not all controlled and directed by our immediate conscious awareness. I think it's so important then, isn't it, that when a soul is beginning to experience these aspects of darkness, that those who help them try to figure out, as it were, what's going on, 
that they have an awareness of this aspect too, that it may not necessarily be something that is, as we might say, there's something wrong with this person or that there is a, sure, there are all elements that have become that make up who we are, all of our experiences and how we express ourselves. But this aspect of the person's spiritual life really needs to be treated with sensitivity and care, doesn't it? You know, I think that some of the, uh, we, we can trust that God is also very much interested to bring people into this greater union with him. That's his great effort with each human person. And if we follow what are, you know, these deeper movements of grace in our lives, then what are they? Well, I was listening to something last week of Mother Teresa speaking, and she did this often, I think, where she talked about how, talking about her sisters, that they have a great sense of knowing they belong all to God. You know, it's expressions like that that really capture perhaps what happens in this deeper disposition of the soul and also in deeper prayer and contemplative grace, that you go into prayer then with this deeper sense of, I belong entirely to you. And it's not something that we are practicing as a technique, you know, to get ourselves into that frame of mind or to bring back that emotional sense but no, a deep sense of identity. I belong to God and deep surrender to him in that. Surrendering oneself more and more, being receptive in one's interior, being toward God, longing for him. These things, you know, once a person is on that track, then they're in the right direction. They're heading toward God. And now it's a question of be faithful and generous in that self-giving, offering oneself in the time of prayer, but then going outside of prayer and matching that, letting it coincide then with how we live outside of prayer as best as possible. There are problems perhaps John of the Cross was alluding to in the beginnings of contemplative graces. People can be confused by the sometimes maybe rapid change of experience in prayer. So this is a certain confusion, which we were talking about in our last conversation. But once a person gets that boat, you know, untied from the shore, then it's a question of now giving God his due. He is the God of love, falling in love, you know, more and more in a deep spiritual manner with Jesus Christ, turning more and being attracted to the reality of his passion finding these gospels, finding a crucifix, a really an attractive reality to gaze on because now we belong more to him who gave himself all for us in love. We'll return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty in just a moment.
We now return to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. You know, I was really struck in also the in the section, The Interior Challenge of Paradoxal Darkness, from your book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation. There was a section in which you were talking about that darkness where St. John of the Cross is contemplating the dark waters from Psalm 17. And you write that the idea of a tabernacle where God hides his bodily presence in the Eucharist is familiar to us. The image of a tabernacle of darkness, however, where God hides within us may not initially attract us. That's a very profound reality that I think of other Carmelites, like Elizabeth of the Trinity and others who are really breaking open again that God is in us just by virtue of our baptism, and he has his dwelling place there. Yes, and you know that is a key truth, a dogmatic doctrinal truth that we affirm in our Catholic faith But in the contemplative reality, as John of the Cross will teach it, he spends a beautiful selection of pages in the beginning of the spiritual canticle on the indwelling presence, because it's not just a doctrinal truth that we affirm in faith, but it's meant to be a living reality. And there is a real presence, not just in the Eucharist and the presence of all Lord in the tabernacle, but the indwelling presence is a real presence personal presence of all Lord. And we are meant to not have a kind of imaginative ongoing conversation, you know, a dialogue that we're making up with him, but rather a sense of real presence and that we are turning to him in our interior reality also, that when we calm down, if we are quiet and silent, it's not just that he is there in a church or chapel He is there within our own heart and soul. And the image that John of the Cross used there from the psalm is that the tabernacle of darkness, that the walls of a tabernacle within us can be a darkness, but he is there within. So this deep certitude, if we remember from that earlier conversation, John of the Cross will say what faith does for our intellect is it does not give us greater clarity and understanding of the truths of faith. It gives us great certitude. That's a very crucial thing in prayer, that we have deep certitude that he is there. He hears words that we speak. He hears the silence of the heart and longing for him. He's very present and personal. And that deep certitude that's given as we grow in the virtue of faith upon our intellect, that's a a serious part of prayer, that we may not see anything, we may be blind, and yet we know he's there. And that is very significant reality for prayer. He's not absent, he's there. Yeah, I just (laughs) think of St. Teresa of Avila and her writings in the interior castle, And that even in that great journey, when you get to the seventh castle, and I am no means a scholar, just only a devotee who has read her works, that when you get to the the seventh castle, you're essentially at this place of he's dwelling within you. He's right there. And there's a sense of peace. I mean, there are all of the things that came before. The awareness is all changed and you're back out in the world and you're doing things, you're living and existing. But everything has changed because there's this new unseen comprehension. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And I don't think we, you know, we don't have to be at the heights of uh, a saint's sanctity for that reality that God is personally present if we're in a state of grace, as the church teaches. And if we cross a threshold in, in a contemplative graces, then that sense of him being with us in companionship is bound to be more pronounced, and it should grow and progress over time so that we can do things to him. We can touch him with our acts of love in the course of a day. The reality in prayer, you know, that makes a very keen thing. The thing is, we don't want to make that an imaginative thing. He's really present, but we don't want to now 
produce, you know, what we think he's saying to us, or allow that to become now an invitation to make messages from him to us. That's a reality that we are meant to be divinized by the real presence of Christ, of the Trinity, you know, within our soul. You know, that's really what, what the saints ended up being. They allowed God to really live in a very vivid way in them. You know, when you listen to Mother Teresa speak in these interviews, which she recorded in the 1980s, in her 70s, you just got a sense that Mother Teresa is speaking, but God is in her in the moment, and it's flowing out of her in a, in a way that she's speaking, you know, with her mind and her attention, but she belongs to God there and is being used by him. Isn't it something, I mean, when you gaze upon the faces of someone like a St. John Paul or, and most definitely Mother Teresa, the world can look at them and say, oh, a santo subito, you know, that here is a saint, this person, you just see it, you just see Christ in them. And yet the real beauty of that is when they look out at us, you could tell by the look of love in their eyes that when they look out at us, they're seeing Christ in all of us. They're seeing that connection in those that they meet and their loving exchange with those people. And whoever they were with, you hear it so often, they were so present to the person that was in front of them. It's kind of remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, it is remarkable. And these saints are, you know, they vary so much. We just recently had the feast of St. Damien of Malachi, and there was a description in the Magnificat of him by someone who knew him. And just the descriptions are so striking, you know, this hardworking man who could do many different things, building, planting, nursing work, digging graves, hardworking. But the phrase that caught my attention was the determined tenacity of this man. He was determined and tenacious about giving himself to the poorest of the poor, you know, these lepers in Malachi. So these saints come in many variations. Some are more active in their, that kind of life of charity. Some are perhaps living in a very hidden, quiet manner in a cloister or a monastery. But in all cases, these are people who cross some threshold at some point of a surrender to God. And the result was that after that, I think they really did sense they belonged now all to God. And then they walked through their life being moved in the direction that that God wanted. And I don't think that's a kind of romantic understanding. That's what they ended up happening in their lives. They ended up being used by God in really infinite ways. He can use human persons for his own divine purposes. Boy, you see that when you visit friends or loved ones in nursing homes. You see it oftentimes when you are present, when people are battling serious illnesses. With those individuals, I should preface, the ones who have come to the point where they have given that abandonment, that they are resting in the will of God, even in their sufferings, even in what they don't understand what's going to come next. But there is that response that you can kind of see with those individuals who have come to that point, and they may not even call it their prayer, it's just how they're living right now. But yet they have such a trust and a faith in God's presence with them. Well, it's an interesting comment, Chris, because we can read St. John of the Cross, and we can be thinking of you know, how he's instructing, especially the young religious, when he begins to talk about these signs of incipient contemplation. And as he goes on in his work, speaking about the progressive experience of God and the contemplative life. But it's very striking, as you just alluded to, that people, as they go on in life, if they have lived faithfully with God, it may be that toward the latter part of life, you know, when trials of illness, incapacity, older age, when that sets in, people without realizing it, they're not reading St. John of the Cross or practicing some kind of method of prayer. They may be entering into what is a more contemplative, real contemplative graces and contemplative life with God. And why? Because they surrender. 
if a person really does abandon themselves to God, if they are offering themselves, you know, then they have the dispositions of the contemplative. And of course, God then responds. He responds with love to one who loves. We may have more contemplatives than we think in those nursing homes, especially when people with their minds are still alert and they are able to pray and offer. You know, there's a great beauty in that period of life also. I'm looking forward to our future conversations as we begin to even explore even deeper aspects of St. John of the Cross, especially found in your book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation. But in closing this particular aspect of our conversation, any final thoughts, Father? Well, just I'm, I'm grateful, Chris, for giving this chance also to talk about these things. And we're not so much preparing what we're going to talk about. We have the book as mm-hmm. a guide, but it's interesting how the course of the conversations runs. And hopefully, you know, God uses this as he uses other things to uh, stimulate us and anyone who listens to this desire for God. When we think about it, if we get to that last week of our life, we're going to be very conscious, you know, the, of the desire for God. We know that he's on the horizon at that point, perhaps very soon. And It's better to be filled with that desire for God much earlier in life. And if that catches hold and gets inflamed in us, then the whole meaning of life changes, that we really discover what is the true, real purpose of life, to desire God and give ourselves to him as fully as possible. And, And God surely responds to that if that catches hold in us. Well, let it be for all of us. I hope it catches hold for all of us. Thank you so much, Father Haggerty. Thank you, Chris. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit ignatius.com to obtain a copy or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty.